Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to MonsteramaCon. Uh, my name is Rob Levy from NeedCoffee.com. Uh, a couple of quick things we want to tell you before we start today. Uh, first, anything with programming you want to find out about, you can go to virtualmonsterama.com or virtual.spy-con.com. That's a lot in one breath, but we got it in. And also this entire weekend, uh, we're encouraging people to donate and help out the Motion Picture and Television Fund. They do great work and uh, they're our charity this weekend. Please help them out. There's information on that on all those websites. So now let's get down to, to, to the brass tacks of why we're all here. Uh, we are joined by Larry Blaumeyer, who is uh, a man of many trades, all of them great. Um, all of them thanks, silly. No, I think I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I'm so thrilled that I get to do this. Um, uh, I, I, I really like off, uh, artists that work across several mediums. So, yeah. So I guess we'll just sort of um, jump in. Um, how are you? I guess that's the first easiest question. How's everything going? That's a great question because I know the answer to that one. Thank God yeah. we started with an easy one. Yeah. Um, I'm fine. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. Thank you. Are you Congrats. doing? How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. You know, I'm chilling, hanging out. Are you doing anything really interestingly creative project wise with all of this is this uh, sponsored? by the way well, well before i talk about projects uh i just want to say that this is crazy because i mean i'm old enough to remember skype yeah so this is um you know this is is quite uh, amazing that we can do this i think um, it's great too yeah yeah it's yeah. a lot easier to use um, than skype yeah i uh have just finished up working on um the uh uh, adventure book of Big Dan Freighter Volume 2, which are audio adventures, a follow-up to Volume 1, which makes sense because this is Volume 2. <laughs> and um, uh, we did a Kickstarter for that, and it went very well. And so that's in the finishing stages right now, and we'll be going out to the folks that um, contributed to the Kickstarter, uh, as well as um, it will be available for sale also as a, as a CD or, or digital uh, and it's five new audio adventures of the characters that um, people are familiar with, probably from Trail of the Screaming Forehead, one of my movies. So. And you have a pretty interesting career doing lots of different things, but you kind of started off doing comics. And I want to talk to you about your, your career in underground comics. I know you did some stuff with Predator and some things like that. Can you sure. sort of talk about how you got into, into doing comics? Career is, is a strong word. Well, I'm being um, nice. I think what I did was uh, uh, Buddy and I published uh, these things on our own. And uh, we, we, you know, there were three issues that came out. It was a learning experience. I was, this kid, I was a kid out of art school. And, and uh, uh, I, 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 I had, pe you know, I, I'm really uh, grateful that people uh, remember the Predator and 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 say like uh you know that they enjoyed it and still enjoy it and uh, and and there are folks who asked me to do another one of course but I, I just didn't have the patience to continue in comics i think there was just there were too many other things i wanted to do and it, it comic book illustration my hat is off to folks who do that because it really is just i think more patience than i have you think the patience required for doing that helped you in any way shape or form for making films uh, well, it, it was, I, I do believe that making those comics was, it was a, it was the cry of a wannabe filmmaker. I mean, it was like, yeah. you know, it, it, it really is like when you're doing that, it's like a storyboard. I, I tried to approach them, especially action scenes, like it was a movie storyboard. So I think it was just the groundwork for me wanting to be in, 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 in movie making. Yeah, because when you watch your films, they're almost sort of laid out like comics. So you can sort of see that lineage a little bit. So I, I was curious as sort of how that influenced it. So. I'm, I'm, well, I'm glad that shows because I, uh, it was important to me to storyboard. Every one of them is storyboarded by me, and, and um, uh, including the first one, my first film, Lost Skeleton Cadaver. And I just felt like... I had to do that. I saw the way I wanted it to go, and I thought, I need this tool going in. This is my first movie. We only have 10 and a half days to shoot it, and so I need all the tools at my disposal, and the storyboard was, was a phenomenal tool to have. 
Um, and I found out in, in, as we got to bigger crews, bigger productions with an actual, you know, a, a, a larger crew and um, slightly larger budgets that everybody was benefiting from the storyboard um, because you put up the boards for the day and everyone has a clear idea what we're shooting. They know what we're going to do. What are we going to see? What do we need to see? What do we need to do? And so it's a great tool. So I want to talk about acting because you hung out in Boston and you ended up getting involved in theater there yeah. and, and acting. Can you kind of talk about your, your, your stage work? Because I think that's kind of overlooked when a lot of people talk about your career. Because I think you have a lot of plays under your belt and some nice yeah. awards and things. Can you just kind of talk about how you got involved in, in theater? Yeah, I, 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 well, the way I got involved, the actual way is a little bit odd because I just... I had a room, one of our, there was a bunch of us living in a, in this, renting this big house. And um, one of them, a couple of them were actors. I, and, and a buddy of mine was, was acting. And I, out of curiosity, went along, I asked if I could go along to an audition with him. And I went along to the audition and um, I uh, thought, you know, I bet I could do this. And I called the director up who I knew and said, could I, could I read for part two? And I ended up getting the part that my buddy had gone out for. Um, <laughs> so it was kind of, it was, it just kind of happened. And I, I think uh, part of it was I, when I got to the audition, I saw that there was some very attractive actresses and I thought theater looks like a lot of fun. I know that's, that's like, such a no. lame reason to get into theater. No, but, I mean, if, 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 band, if people in bands can use it, it's fair, <laughs> it's fair game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, and I think when I was doing theater, I think I even, even the theater I was doing uh, when I started to write and direct had a cinematic uh, feel to it also, I think. And I, I think I was trying to bring that aspect to it. The first play I did was a Western, very dark Western. And some of the reviews uh, described it as sort of cinematic um, in, in the way it was directed out, it was staged out outdoors. And um, um, so I think even then I was, you know, I was, I was, I was still sort of leaning towards movies. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, I learned a lot from theater and had amazing experiences in Boston. And um, a lot of it was outdoor theater, which is a lot of hard work. And, and yeah. it was uh, learn on the job and uh, no wimps allowed. I mean, it was, you know, we're carrying light poles up and down hills and stuff. And, and um, everybody worked. It was a great, it was a great learning experience, a tremendous experience. Yeah, because you did, you had Jump Camp, which is 85, right? I think. Yes. And yeah. then Robin and Robin Hood, which did, did really well as well. And Robin Hood, I, I, I'm very happy about that. I'm very grateful. Robin Hood is still, is performed a lot because yeah. uh, it was published, um, I think, uh, what was it, about 1990. Um, it's uh, Samuel French has the rights, all of Samuel French just changed names, and I'm, they're now a different company name after many years, and I don't remember the name. But um, mostly schools do uh, my play of Robin Hood. Um, and I, it's been performed all over the world. Uh, most of it is schools, but, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool to have this, like, legacy of theater. You know, you and Olivier have something in common now. <laughs> well, yeah. and a first name, the same first name. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, two things in common. Hey, there you go. So um, I know you have the, the monster stuff. We'll get to that. But Westerns are kind of a thing, kind of another thing you, you do a lot with. Do you like Westerns as a genre? Loved Westerns as a genre. And um, it's, in fact, really, it's up there with horror and sci-fi movies for yeah. me. Yeah, me um, too. I, I loved Westerns since I was a kid, and I still do. And um, I'm very particular about them. I, 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 I recently rewatched the assassination of uh, Jesse James by the coward Bob Ford, which was just as good the second time as it was the, the first yeah. time. I think that's one of the best Westerns in years. People, it, it's, you know, the thing that people do is they say in the business, Westerns are dead. No, one, no one's making Westerns anymore until, until like the next Western comes up. Yeah. These people are still making westerns, no matter what they say. Yeah. Um, now I have um, two collections of, of uh, my my western horror short stories. Yeah. 
because uh, I also feel that the, the Old West, for some reason, is a great, it's a great landscape um, for horror. Uh, and uh, it, there's something very enticing about it for me. And, um, um, and I have uh, two of these books, they're called the Tales of the Calamo Mountains. And I try to make them more like, more like Western folk tales in a way. Um, sometimes pretty dark, but, but as opposed to um, Western horror stories about, that are about vampires and gunslingers and gunslingers who are vampires and stuff like that. And not that, I mean, that, and those are fine. Those are fine. It's just not what I wanted to do as a, mm -hmm. as a horror Western. Um, uh, so, but that's been, uh, that's been a really uh, rewarding experience writing those short stories. And I think, you know, I think Westerns really get sort of under underappreciated because they really let you sort of explore the darker psyche of people, much like horror does. But yeah. horror, it's so obvious, you know, a lot of the horror that's in Westerns isn't monsters, it's monsters inside, you know, people. And yeah. Yeah. I think you can really build interesting characters with, with Westerns. I think a lot of people have for years. I mean, Ford, Ford went nuts doing them. You know, and, so. uh, yes, and and if you look at uh, if you look at television, I, I, I've been recently enjoying the um, the Gunsmoke complete collection, uh, the the TV series, which is twenty yeah. seasons in this large heavy box, and revisiting those. And a lot of those were written by John Meston, who also wrote the the great uh, Gunsmoke radio shows, um, and. Talk about bringing out the dark side of uh, humanity. Meston was a, a, a real master of doing that. And um, uh, it, 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 Gunsmoke is um, uh, just yeah. a, an amazing experience and, and achievement uh, to, to have such a high level of quality for 20 seasons. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think the Western will just continue on. Well, I mean, we're getting them now. I mean, you have. Firefly was basically a Western and Mandalorian is basically a Western too. You know, so it's interesting how that genre has sort of just taken off um, a little yeah. bit. So jumping into movies, um, one of the things, we touched upon this a little bit before the panel. Um, one of the interesting things now is, you know, when I saw Lost Skeleton of Cadaver, I saw it in a the theater, right? It was awesome going to my art house theater. It was dark, it was great. But now there's, the streaming services are huge. So as a filmmaker, does that help you having your film being streamed? Uh, or is it easier, or do you prefer the old school way in a theater and have people see it? Or are they both? How, does, how do you make movies and get your movies seen by people in this crazy world? I, I, think, it's, I, think, that's, I think it's all good, but I, I I just wish I don't want streaming to take the place of I, I like to have my DVD and Blu-ray collection. Mm -hmm. I like to have that library, and I know a lot of other folks do too, movie fans. And, mm -hmm. and um, I don't want that to go away because everything's streamed. Uh, but I do think uh, I, I, I do think if you're talking about generating more content, uh, I, I think yeah, I you know Amazon's making films and everybody's making films and I think that's I think that's a good thing um lately we've been putting out um uh we being uh, uh, Mark Allen Stewart of uh, Hydraulic Productions and I have been putting out uh, blu-rays of my films uh, we've got uh, Lost Gallery Returns Again Dark and Stormy Night and Trail of Screaming Forehead on blu-ray so um uh we've been uh putting those out there via, via Kickstarters. Um, and they haven't really, uh, my stuff hasn't done, has not had much streaming. Um, I suppose it's only a matter of time before, uh, yeah. before we uh, enter into some deal like that, but, um, but this you can, we have not. Cause you can rent some of them on Amazon prime, but it, um, yeah which is, you know, still great. It's a great way for people that have not seen your work right. to not have to wait around until their college theater gets it or they go to a convention or something. Mm -hmm. So that access was great. But the downside is you got all the other stuff to mess with. Right. Yeah. Um, 
So let's talk about filmmaking. What made you just say, oh, the hell with it, acting's great, drawing comics is, you know, is what it is. I want to make films and I want to put skeletons and strings in them and scare people and stuff. What made you decide to do that? Well, uh, it, it, it came about with a lot less planning than what you just said. It was so, okay. <laughs> it was, there was like, you know, I had no thoughts of, um, of I really want to get the, I really want to have a, a rejuvenate, a, a, a reborn uh, skeleton, you know, in a movie. I mean, it was, it was more like, how can I make a movie that is, um, that is inexpensive and incorporates everything I love about the sci-fi and horror movies, the low budget ones mostly, that I grew up with as mm -hmm. a kid. Yeah, uh, and it it appealed to the absurdist in me, and and um, I love absurd humor, and and so that was th that absurdity was as important as the um, as the the various tropes that we that we spoof from the nineteen fifties, and if you look at Lost Skeleton, it, uh, you know I've got we've got um, um, this this animal woman who is transformed, and she's she's looks something like the cat women of the moon. And then we've got um, uh, the skeleton himself, which is, uh, I, I thought, you know, what is, what's the cheapest movie monster, you know? And, and really, if you, you know, it's, it's this plastic um, uh, uh, surgical model, basically, this prop uh, is about as cheap as you can get. Um, but of course, given a voice that is extremely commanding and, and obnoxious. Um, and, uh, and then we've got a pair of aliens who were, were definitely inspired by Plan 9 from Outer Space, the characters of uh, Eros and Tana in that movie, who I, I just, I've always found really delightful, uh, especially their bickering. Um, and Lattice and Crowbar are somewhat, in, they're inspired by them, but they became their own, you know, definitely their own things, courtesy of Andy Parks and Susan McConnell. Um, uh, and of course, I didn't leave out acting because I ended up being in it. Now that yeah. was, I, I questioned that decision. It was, it was kind of like, uh, you know, it's my first movie and it would be easier rather than me telling an actor how I want this guy played, maybe I should just play that role. And let me tell you, for, you know, a first film, I think that's not advisable because that's really, that is really going to drive you kind of nuts. Um, there are times when I'm in my movies, you know, I, and I, and I'm just going like, oh, I can't wait for a scene that I'm not in so I can just sit behind the camera mm -hmm. and watch and, and have that perspective. Um, but I'll never forget that the first day of shooting, we were in Bronson, Bronson Canyon, Grunson Caves, chilly, chilly morning. And, um, you know, we're there, we get there sometime, I guess, 4 a.m. or something like that, you know, and it's. And, and we're, we're in that cave there with it, and, and we're shooting the, um, the resurrection of the skeleton and, um, uh, and we have a little, you know, a little monitor about this big and it was so crude and, uh, but I'll never forget that first morning. I mean, it was pretty exciting. You know, we're doing it. Wow. Wow. We're, we're really doing this. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. And is, where is the skeleton now? Is it like in your basement? You dig it out to, you know. No, there are rumors. There, or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there are rumors now. I think uh, it, 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 it's possible that uh, I, I think the producer Miguel Valenti might have it. Um, but I'm, I, I'm not absolutely certain about that. And I don't go looking for him because the skeleton is, he's not my favorite actor. It's not somebody yeah. I like to, uh, yeah. you know, hang out with and, uh, uh, he's tough enough on set, never mind in real life. Because I imagine so, it would be tough to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wanted a trailer on his first movie, so it's just yeah. ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I can tell you that that is the transmutatron. I think uh -huh. I'm pointing to it right there. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, there's the transmutatron, transmutatron. from Lost Skeleton, first movie. Um, nice. But. Skeleton, we'll keep him a mystery. Now, Lost Skeleton returns again. Of course, he's just a head. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, that was a different actor, if you will. Yeah, because because by that time, Skeleton was too much money and <laughs> yeah, too hard to work too with. Much. Too much. Yeah, it's way too much. So 
what, what I love about Lost Skeleton is it's just, it is a homage to everything I love about, you know, like you said, B movies and B sci-fi movies, but it totally works in a way that people that have never seen those movies can go and laugh their head off. And I think that is the sort of the quintessential beauty of it. You know, that's, and that, that was a good thing to hear because there were, you know, people would tell us that it's really, it's a niche thing. You really have to, you have to really know this stuff, know the genre to appreciate this movie. And therefore like, you know, kids today, they're not going to, they, they won't, they don't know these, you know, fifties black and white movies. What are they going to, they're not going to, mm-hmm. but turns out that I'm still hearing about kids today that are enjoying these movies. Uh, folks who are fans of Lost Skeleton, they have kids and they're showing the movies to their kids and, um, and they're enjoying them on a certain level. And, and I guess it, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that can be enjoyed on, on, on a couple of different levels. Kids like the silliness, the goofiness, and um, the adults maybe appreciate things that they recognize from, from those old movies. So that was cool. That was a relief because yeah. I want to make something that is, you know, just appreciated by a very small amount of people. So not that we have, I mean, we're still, you know, it's not like a vast cult here, um, yeah. but, but I'm grateful that we have a lot of fans and, and that they are great fans. So. Baby, you watch Cadaver and you watch Screaming Forehead and Stormy Night, there is a certain charm and heart to those films that I think, regardless of any genre, they, they all sort of have their own little thing. And I think they, it goes down to the core of what films are, is their escapism. In many for a lot of people. I mean, yes, it's art, but for a lot of people, movies are just escapism. And I think, you know, sometimes being able to see a movie or movies like that and not have to think too hard, but be able to laugh and really um, become a part of that, I think that's I think that's a part of the appeal of them. Yeah, I uh I I think you know, um I guess the the phrase that people would use is a blue sky film. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I think I first heard that term associated with uh, with the TV show Psych, which which I, I loved. I thought it was just fantastic. Yeah. And I think that um, I, I think it sort of, sort of applies uh, because uh, it's not in my nature to put something into these movies that is at all mean spirited in any way. Um, I, I want these to be entertaining and I want people to, you know, to feel good about them and, and to feel good afterwards. And, yeah. um, you, you know, we've got enough and, and, and I, I see a lot of dark stuff. I mean, I watch, I watch, uh, you know, uh, um, plenty of uh, uh, dark films and, and TV and stuff, but it, it, I think it's nice to have something else too, to have something that is, you know, God forbid a family film. I mean, yeah. you wouldn't really call these family films because they're not, that's not what they were intended for. But, you know, you, a family can watch it. You know, it doesn't matter. The, there's no age uh, limit there. Um, little kids can watch it and enjoy it. So, so I guess that's sort of intentional, but it's not exactly something I think about. You know, it just is. Yeah. And you've got the other stuff, like the Westerns, that you could be more adult and right. gritty. If you need to, which right, is good. definitely, yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, a, it's definitely a different thing. I wrote a western a couple of years ago, a western film script uh, called White Hook. That is, um, and I I set out to have the biggest climax of any western ever. I mean, there it, it's it's extremely um, it's violent, and and there's a lot of action in it. So that's the other side of me, sort of, you know, mm-hmm. getting that out of my system, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of, people, a lot of directors and, and writers have that duality. So I think you almost have to in order to function artistically, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, think, I think that makes sense. Yeah, especially, and, and I, have, I always have a thing about being tied to one kind of thing. Uh, 
I, I, I don't like being pinned down to a certain thing like I do this kind of movie or I do these kind of this kind of artwork or uh, I, yeah. I, I like to, to shake it up and, and do all kinds of different things. Um, and I find myself pulled that way. It's not it's not even intentional. It's, you know, I've got like a bunch of muses at work and they're all fighting each other sometimes. Yep. Um, I'll be finishing up some some illustrations and boy, I really want to write that. I'd love to write a play here, you know, and I've got that urge happening and I gotta gotta fight it and kind of stay focused. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's I I I I shouldn't complain. I'm 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 fortunate to be able to do a number of things reasonably well, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I shouldn't complain about you know being pulled in so many different directions. Is there any advice you can give to people that are either aspiring filmmakers or screenwriters or even just artists trying to sort of find their voice or get their, get their work out there? Well, one of the thing, one thing that, um, that I've taken to heart repeatedly because you have to keep reminding yourself, I have to keep reminding myself of this when I'm writing a script or writing anything really, that you, you, you've got to write a terrible first draft in order to write a, a good second draft. So when you start, just start writing. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about how good it is or bad or whatever. Just write it. Just get it out of your system. Then you can look at that crappy first draft and go, now I know where this is going. Now I know where I want it to go. Mm-hmm. Because the worst thing is staring at that page. And I still do it. I still have to... That's a, it's a hard lesson that I keep learning that I that you just just go ahead just 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 write it and then and then get get it done and it's terrible but it has to be terrible it's a first draft now not always you know not that's not always the case but I think it's good to just you know just start writing that's that sounds like such obvious advice just start writing but it's true it's true just start writing yeah. and as far as the film goes um my advice is to um try to uh just try to shoot it whatever it is try to you know get together with friends um and working with friends by the way i cannot speak highly enough about that it it, uh it's a wonderful thing i'm still working with you know with friends of mine um on the Big Dan Freighter stuff we just did brian howe and allison martin and dan conroy the, the main characters in that and and uh, I've been working with them for years. You know, Allison was not in Lost Skeleton, but then joined us in uh, Trail of Screaming Forehead right after that. And she's in Dark and Stormy Night, of course. And, and um, uh, so th- th- it's, 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 I'm getting a little off track of your question. Here, oh, no, you're doing it. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. The Zoom might like shut down now because I'm. I'm eh, you're fine. All right. So. Uh, uh, Working with friends and writing for friends is a wonderful thing. Maybe that's a good thing for <clears throat> for budding writers too, uh, or budding filmmakers. Write for friends that you know, you know what they can do, mm-hmm. and and uh, and I have that luxury when I'm writing something that I know uh, I know what these folks can do, and uh, it's it, it's a uh, uh, it, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. Um, and also, it's fun to see them stretch, too, which I deliberately, uh, I always go against that grain of, of cubbyholing. Once again, I don't like anyone being pigeonholed. I like to see people stretch it. When you've got good actors like this company, terrific actors, they can do all kinds of different parts. And so that's what we do. You know, it's always, it's always different. The parts are always mixed up. And uh, yeah, yeah. so you got Betty, you know, poor, poor clueless Betty, Armstrong played by Faye Masterson. Uh, and then in Trail of Screaming Forehead, she's, she's a rather devious and complex scientist. Um, and that's, that's a fun thing to do, set people up like that. I mean, you got your own little Mercury Theater thing going on here. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, and I imagine, too, for you, it helps you sort of find your voice a little clearer when you're working on the projects and sort of knowing where all, how all the pieces fit together. Yes. you you um, you instantly are hearing those voices and that's important Uh, it's just it's 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 great i mean it really helps it helps as a writer it it helps to shortcut things because you hear their voices and i can imagine what they're what they're saying 
as those characters. Yeah, because I love I love when I when I see your films, sort of like, oh, it's that guy from here and that guy from. I mean, that that's really cool to see. But then you're like, oh, there you are, not at all like this character or that character. And that's it is kind of fun to sort of. Yeah. You feel like you're dropping in on people you've known for years, which right. is kind of right. interesting. Yeah. So um, this is the part where you might get mad at me and and, and Zoom, but so you briefly were in Spencer for Hire. Um, <laughs> well, can, yeah. Can me you and everybody us? else in Boston. Yeah. That was, can, you know, when you're, when you're a, a SAG actor in, in a place that's, well, not New York or LA, uh, at least at that time. Now at that time, because now there's a lot more regional uh, filmmaking and TV, but at that time with Spencer for Hire, uh, Having a, having a, a show in town, doing a whole season, that was like, yeah, let's get work. And I did some extra work on there. And then I did, yeah. and I got, I think I got one line um, in one episode on there or something like that. But you get, when, you, when you're, you know, when you're in Boston as a SAG actor, you're just getting everything you can, commercials, yeah. and deals, whatever. But did that sort of like being able to put that on your resume sort of help you at all? It's like, hey, I was in Spencer. For yeah, oh, I, I definitely put it on my resume. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, again, you're not getting you're not getting that much, um, at least at that time. Yeah. In Boston, so to have a a, a network TV show. Yeah. Shooting there was um, that was a good deal. Yeah, definitely. And uh, but you know, I I I, I learned something on those sets too. Um, I remember the first time I did extra work on, on Spencer um, it was on Boston Common and uh, shooting outdoors. And, and uh, I, got to, I just got to really kind of study the set and the set dynamic and how the, you know, the director gets pissed about something. He takes it out on the AD and the AD takes it out on the second day D who takes it out on the PAs and, and it goes down like that. And, and I think I made an unconscious decision. If I'm making movies, we're not going to do that. I don't want, I, I always try to have a happy set. I don't want to, that stress. I don't want to see that. I mean, I, I just, there's no need for it. You know, I think it's possible to make movies and have fun and, and those sets watching, you know, Spencer for higher sets were not fun. And in fact, the same with the movies that would come and shoot in Boston. Um, you know, uh, they, they uh, you, you just, you, all, you, all you feel is a certain tension on those yeah. sets. So I made a vow, I made a vow. Never, yeah. never, not on my sets by God. <laughs> Cause I've heard, you know, I've heard that that set and a lot of, a lot of dramas that were filmed in that period across the board, they always had very, tense and um really just the grippingly angsty sets because they were all under such deadlines and they had such you know these are our target goals you know oh yeah yeah you got to make your day i mean it's and it was the same with us we had to make our day even more so because we are uh you know the stuff that we're doing is is very low budget and every penny counts and so we have to make our day too and and we did. We usually, I think we always did. I mean, yeah. we made our day. You had a certain amount, you got to shoot by that the sun going down or whatever. And, and, uh, and we did it, but we did it without, uh, with relatively little uh, uh, stress. Yeah. You know, I mean, well, there, there was, you know, I, I, I mean, there's stress. I, I, I shouldn't say there's no stress because, you, you know, you're under you're a certain amount of pressure. But we didn't take it out on each other. You know, yeah. it, it, and I think I think there's a way of doing it where people respect each other and have fun working together, even under that pressure. Do you think that um, you always hear like on TV sets and movies, you know, the extras are always over here and the actors that are the cast are over here, or the crews are over here. And there's no intermingling. Do you think that culture's changed um, since that time? I, I have no idea. You know, I don't know because I haven't. It's been a long time since I yeah. was. I mean, on, on the sets of our movies, we didn't, we never had that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, you got the holding area for the extras and, and it was always, it was always such a, I mean, 
the holding area for extras on those things is so funny because you're all sitting around somebody's reading a newspaper and somebody could you talk a little bit i what i what i what i find another interesting thing about your career is that you uh with your art it tends to be and if i'm interpreting this wrong you know virtually slap me um i it looks very it feels almost very 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 uh entrenched in surrealism and your film work is very sort of absorbed in the absurd. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, another thing you have in common with Dolly. Um, can you kind of talk about the connection, if, or is there one, between absurdism and surrealism? Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting because um, Tim Lucas, a video watchdog, who's now a friend of mine, he, he, yeah. when he reviewed um, Lost Skeleton, he uh, he, I think he referred to me as one of the few working working surrealists or something yeah. to that effect in film, and and I I, I kind of thought oh yeah I, you know I I mean it, it I, I saw it because when I started painting, mm -hmm. um, when I you know like a, a, as a kid, um, seeing the work of Dolly and Magritte I was like blown away by that stuff so I would um, I was trying to do some uh some very strange dreamlike paintings uh in a, in a similar way in my own way and at the same time i was influenced by comic you know comic books like well like frazetta covers and stuff so there was that influence yeah. too but but the surrealism has always appealed to me in in any medium in any medium and um and so the earliest paintings i was doing were um were rather surrealist but I did not re realize that, you know, that Lost Skeleton uh, and, and the other films are, they are also a kind of surrealism. Yeah. And um, so I think there, there is a definite correlation between absurdity and, and, uh, and surrealism. And what is it about, what is it about painting, uh, or sorry, about painting, about making art that you, enjoy is it like the calm because you're so busy with other things you just sort of get to put all that away or is it just the release of the self-expression what is it about that that appeals to you or do you know i don't know i just know that that's the first thing i started doing i mean i know yeah. that as a you know as a kid i was drawing i started drawing monsters and stuff like i'm sure you know yeah so many other kids and um monsters are you know, there, there, there's something of a, of a uh, surrealistic quality to just the idea of a monster. Yeah. Um, because it's, it, it's a strange, it's an, it's, it's an intrusion of strangeness in, into our reality. And, and it's that surrealism that, um, that appeals to me in, in so many of my favorite sci-fi and horror movies. Um, uh, like, I mean, take Fiend Without a Face, for instance. Mm -hmm the fantastic stop motion imagery in that is, 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 is fairly surreal when you look at it, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I can't, I, I can't say where that came from. I mean, creativity is kind of a mystery to me anyway. I don't understand where yeah. it comes from. Uh, you, you just you get in the zone and it's like, uh, why am I there? How am I here? You just, w when I start working and I forget t the time passing, I've got some yeah. music playing and, and, and suddenly like, you know, I'll look at it. I'll, I'm doing a lot of digital art these days. Uh, yeah. The illustration stuff I've been just doing now, in fact, is, is um, uh, on a tablet and I'll have the mu music playing and, and I'm going, you know, wow, I'm not feeling this. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to you get there. It's like, it's, I'm looking at like a mountain I got to get over. And then suddenly the next thing I know, I just forget about it and I'm just going, I'm going, I'm like, oh, look at that. It looks pretty good, you know? Yeah. Uh, so how that works, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, but it is the same kind of getting in the zone, you know, it's the same kind of thing with writing too. Um, writing and art uh, uh, have, a, have a, a, a similar way of, uh, yeah. of drawing you into it or drawing me into it, you know? Yeah. And with dark i want to talk to you about dark and stormy night can we talk about that yeah because you sort of take everything you did with the 50s but you go to the 30s in dark yeah. and stormy night 
And I'm just kind of wondering, can you just sort of talk about the origin of that? Because outside of Cadaver, that's my other favorite film of yours. Um, they're all great though. Um, can you talk a little bit about the idea for that and sort of making the, making the film? Yeah, it, it, uh, it was my, uh, I, I think it was a, a, just an urge I had for a long time to make an old dark house movie. I just, I love uh, the idea of old dark house movies and there, there are a zillion of them um, in the twenties and thirties. And, um, uh, and really the, uh, the idea of an old dark house movie is still alive. I mean, uh, Knives Out was something of a modern day mm -hmm. old dark house movie yeah. in some ways. Um, but then you have a movie like Identity, uh, which was, you recall with John Cusack, that uh, film was set at a motel. That was essentially the, the sort of, um, and then there were none concept, uh, which is my favorite aspect of, of an old dark house movie only set in, you know, in a, in a modern, in modern times. Um, but it was essentially an old dark motel. Um, and I like the, I like the idea of, I like murder mysteries like that, the isolation, the paranoia, um, which is Carpenter's thing. The thing is, is, yeah. is one of my favorite yeah. films. And when I say paranoia and isolation, I think I love, I love that movie. Anyway, um, but, <laughs> but, but I, I, um, uh, had it, it just all this old dark house, all his tropes had been brewing for years, and I just had to do it. I had to do it, and I, I just set about writing it. I wrote it with, with, um, with my folks, you know, our our wonderful mm -hmm. stock company in mind, and the the parts seemed so clearly delineated. It just seemed everything seemed to fit as far as like, um, which role they would do, and everybody brought their best game to that movie and um and tony trembley built amazing sets this was the first thing i'd done in entirely in a sound stage the whole thing in a sound stage everything artificial miniatures or or sets um which was really in keeping with the 1930s old dark house movie because they were all in in a sound stage and and that's a that's a, if we had shot that in an actual mansion, first of all, you're going to worry all the time about don't, don't, don't scratch that dolly's going to scratch the, you know, you're going to scratch the floor, you're going to do that, watch that vase. I mean, it's just, you, you yeah. don't need that. Plus, it just wouldn't feel right, you know? So, yeah. so Tony made this incredible set. And we'd walk around there, you got, you know, secret passageways and stuff. And then Bob <laughs> Burns, when I met Bob Burns on um, Lost Gallant Returns again, I said, yeah, I said we're, we're going to do an old Dark House movie. And uh, he came to the set and, uh, of Lost Gallant Returns again. And, and um, he said, he said, do you need a gorilla? <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, yes. And that was it. That was it. Kogar was going to be in our movie. I mean, it, it was incredible. And, and, that, and, and really, if you look at all of the, the old Dark House tropes, the gorilla was the last thing we needed. That was the one thing we needed, right? Yeah. So now we got everything. And um, it's, 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 it's a, a favorite of a lot of people, I think. Yeah. And looping back, it also sort of feels like a play at the same time. Yeah. It could Which easily be a play. I've had people ask me to adapt it as a yeah. play. Maybe I will at some point. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. It does have that feel. So, one of the things I've I've heard, um, not for true a while, for a while. Not true. No, I deny it. I deny okay. it. Okay. Um, but I'm going to ask anyway. Okay. Um, is there any chance of a lost cadaver, uh, lost skeleton musical? Well, you know that. You know, I started working on that. Um, a this has been floating ago. around for a while. Yeah. In You're fact, at, at Monsterama, just a just a few years ago at yeah. Monsterama, I, I was on a panel there, and I believe I actually you know, sang a couple of the prototype songs, um, Ranger Brad's ballad, I think, the ballad of Ranger yeah. Brad, and um, I actually sat on the panel and sang that. Wow, Larry. So. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things, I've got too many things brewing. I always have too many things brewing. Yeah. And um, 
and I, I can only get to so many of them. And I, yeah, a, a, a lot of that is because I'm not in the musical game. I'm not like in touch with um, uh, anyone who's, you know, a Broadway producer or a musical producer, yeah. even, or even someone who would um, give a trial to a play out in, um, in, in some part of the country and work it and work it and then bring it to New York, which is the way I think, you know, a lot of these things happen. I just don't, I'm not, I don't have that yeah. resource. If, if I was in touch with somebody like that who thought, oh yeah, a Lost Skeleton musical, sure. You know, um, and I, I, I did, um, I did attempt to work on it for a bit and uh, sketched out some ideas, but ultimately there were other things that were more pressing and, yeah. uh, you know, making, you know, making some money doing commissions and stuff like that. And, yeah. But uh, never say never, right? So let's see. Yeah. And you don't want to always go back to the same project over and over too, in many ways, probably. Right. Right. So well, uh, yeah, you know, I I I was afraid of, of sort of being the lost skeleton guy for, for a while. I'm thinking like, yeah, but you know, I do paintings too. It's not just that. I make other stuff too. Hey, but uh, but now I'm like, I don't, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. I'm the lost skeleton guy. That's all right. So you made lost skeleton. Did you know you were going to do a sequel, or did that sort of just happen? No, again? I knew I wasn't going to do a sequel. Okay, because it doesn't feel like there's going to be a sequel, no. even though it has the question marks and everything at the end. Yeah, and that was that was just certainly a uh, you know a nod to the '50s movies, sort yeah. of like you know that 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 ominous question at the end. But but I was I would you know there was no way I was going to do a sequel until an idea came to me, and so. Uh, I think I was I was watching um, some old jungle show on TV or something, and yeah. uh, I had um, I think it was an episode of Soldiers of Fortune, which was a a, a 1950s series that came out on DVD uh, probably around 2004 or five or something like that, and I was watching an episode yeah. and I thought um, this I just suddenly had the crazy image of of you know, white bread, um, Dr. Paul Armstrong, you know, suddenly becoming a, a bitter drunk scientist in the jungle, lost in the jungle kind of thing. And it seemed, uh, it seemed so ridiculous. It amused me. It amused me. And so that led to, you know, from one thing to another. I thought, well, how would he, what would happen? Of course, Betty, would be kind of like, oh, that's okay. He's in the jungle. He's been there for two years. That's fine. And and uh, it, it just grew from there. I saw how all the characters could come into play in this. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to bring Allison Martin in. I really wanted to. Uh, who She wasn't in Lost Skeleton, but uh, she came in as, you know, Chinfa, the uh, queen of the cantaloupe people. Um, I love and, that. Uh, <laughs> I love that. So... Uh, you know, it uh, it kind of just it kind of just naturally occurred, and I think that's the way a sequel should should happen. Because normally I don't like them because they they tend to repeat the uh, uh, elements of the first film rather than go anywhere new. So I thought yeah. if I can't go somewhere new, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So this brings us to the film we haven't really talked much about, which is Trail of the Screaming Forehead, yeah. another iconic work from you. Um, you want to talk about sort of the ideas for that and, and, and making mm -hmm. that one? Because that's also hilariously awesome. Uh, thank you. That was, uh, it, it uh, you know, that's one I think that splits the fans a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I think some folks um, who are Lost Skeleton fans find that one a little disappointing because the tone is a little bit different. And again, that's me. I don't want to, I don't want it to be the same. I want to be different. It's kind yeah. of, it's in the same. It's in the, it's in the same box of candy, but it's a different flavor. Yeah. If I could use that metaphor without yes. making people sick, I hope. So, it it, uh, it it looks at you know '50s invasion movies, but not black and white, um, but widescreen 
technicolor and um, and using a little bit of stop motion, which I, I love stop motion animation. Mm -hmm. And when I say little, I mean there there really is a, it, it, it's really a little because that is a costly process. But that was the first time working with the Kyoto Brothers, which was great, and Frank Ippolito, and um, uh, it it uh, it came to me um, right after we lo uh, wrapped Lost Skeleton, which is the way these things seem to happen because you're when you you know you're you're riding that adrenaline when you we wrapped Lost Skeleton in ten and a half days, and then my mind started to you know let let go a little bit and open up and yeah. what came in floating foreheads came in and uh the forehead i picked of course like the skeleton it seemed awkward and silly what invasion from outer space would be ridiculous you know uh crawling foreheads it's just the forehead is such a nebulous yeah hard to define thing and you know, um, it's not like, you know, a nose or an ear, which you could easily, you know, see crawling along. I, I actually do sometimes. But um, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, it was, you know, uh, it was an absurd invasion. It's an incompetent alien invasion. That was important. Um, there are some tremendous performances in that. Everybody's really good in that, I think. But my favorites are... Uh, Mr. H.M. Winant as um, Dr. Applethorpe. Uh, I had asked Martin Landau to do that part, and he was starting a series, um, and uh, uh, and then um, who was I think it was yeah Christopher Caliendo, the composer said I know H.M. Winant. I said really? Oh okay. I knew H.M. Winant from when I was a kid from so much TV and uh, 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 like, and especially the, the Howling Man episode of The Twilight Zone, everyone seems to know him from that, but he did a lot. I mean, he worked at Sam Fuller movies. And, yeah. um, so he is a masterful villain in, in, in this. His, his performance, I just love it. When we were, uh, when it was being remastered for the, the Blu-ray we just did, you know, I'm seeing it all again. Um, also, Andy Parks, uh, Andy, you know, Crowbar in um, Lost Skeleton, and now he plays, he, he, he infuses Dr. Philip Latham with such pathos. I mean, it's really uh, a wonderful performance, and I'm saying pathos in, in this silly, silly movie, but, yeah. but, uh, I, I, but you know, yes. I, do want it to, I do want people to care about the man, and that's important no matter how silly your movie is, and, and another performance, two more performances that, that are, everybody's great. I don't want to, I don't want to just, yeah. but I do want to mention two more and that's um, uh, Faye Masterson as Dr. Sheila Baxter, who is, is extraordinary. And, um, and I think Jennifer Blair's favorite performance, she will tell you, is Droxy Chappelle. Mm -hmm. The uh, not too bright, um, kind of low life chick there who hangs out with Nick Vassadine. And um, uh, these are all great performances, but I'm very, I'm very proud of that movie. I think um, um, I, 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 I like seeing it again. And, um, and I'm glad we were able to, you know, remaster it for, for Blu-ray. There's a lot of layers to it too, which is really surprising. Not that, yeah, I mean, cause you think of Cadaver and you're like, it is, this is what it is. And, uh, some of the other stuff, yeah. you know, it is what it is. But this has got a lot of little interesting moving parts in it that I think are, is really fascinating. Well, that's interesting. And, it, it, you know, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. And I think, um, and first of all, it doubled the amount of cast from, you know, Lost yeah. Skeleton had eight people or something. And, and, and suddenly we have 16 principals. And, um, and, and again, even though it's silly, you want it to be, you want the relationships to be genuine. I mean, you have, you know, Trish Geiger is, you know, Poor Trish, Trish's Mary Latham, the long-suffering wife of, of her not incredibly bright Phil, husband Philip, uh, and and the, and and so yeah, there's uh, 
there, there, I, I think there's a, a lot going on there um, for a movie of this kind. And of course we have Dan and Dutch and Millie that uh, Brian and Dan and Allison just embraced these parts. I had, I had come up with these characters prior to this, uh, thought of maybe, you know, for an animated adventure or something. And um, they just fit in this scenario. And Brian and Dan and Allison just owned these roles instantly and they still own them. Yeah. The audio stuff we're doing. Um, so yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy with that movie. Did you, did you like revisiting your movies and remastering them and doing all that? Did you, did you like that? Yeah, I did because I don't watch them. I mean, I don't, uh, you know, I, I tend to, um, uh, I, I, it's weird to watch your own movie, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and so I don't do that a lot. This was, I had to here when we do these Blu-rays, I had to watch them again. And, and when I do, I kind of go, hey, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't too bad. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird thing. But it's kind of cool because it kind of gets your brain going creatively for something else too, you know. Um, so before we, before we started recording, you were talking a little bit about Lost Skeleton of Cadavra, and Sony has it. Do you, is there any chance of that coming out on, as like a Blu-ray or a different edition other than the standard, or is that a... Well, whole... um, hold that thought. Okay. Uh, it, it's the most requested thing right now because yeah. Skeleton Returns and Forehead and Dark and Stormy have come out on Blu-ray. Now folks want to naturally want to have the first skeleton on Blu-ray. So that's all I can say right now. Just uh, okay. stand by. Okay. Deluxe edition with like five hour, five hour, four CD set. <laughs> Different part of the skeleton with every, everything. Mm -hmm. So um, what are you working on now that you can talk about? And then um, that kind of leads into the what's next. Okay. Well, uh, I am, Right now, I'm finishing up some illustrations for uh, a role-playing game called uh, They Came From Beneath the Sea, which is for uh, Matthew Dawkins and Onyx Press. Um, and I've been working with them on this for a couple of years now. I did some writing for them. I don't know RPG. I am new to it. I was sort of like, wow, I don't know if I can do this. And I still don't fully understand the mechanics, I confess. But working on it has been fun, Matthew recruited me uh, deliberately. I mean, he, he, he sought me out because um, he, he uh, was inspired by my films, which was very mm -hmm. flattering. And so he brought me on board as a writer, uh, more of the story guy mm -hmm. and illustrator. And I just did, I'm finishing up five more illustrations for them. And uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm glad when I get to go and illustrate again, um, or do any kind of graphics. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing uh, I should mention with uh, Mark Stewart, we had, when we put out these Blu-rays, we have something called these reanimated movie classics, mm -hmm. which are, uh, we wanted to have some extras, entertaining extras to go with the Blu-ray releases. And so I take public domain material, like a 20 minute, yeah. you know, industrial film of some kind and, or educational film or whatever, and, um, and redub it. Mm -hmm. which is a lot of fun. And we, we have some, um, uh, we, we offered a Kickstarter pledge, uh, several pledges to folks. They pledge a certain amount and they get to do a voiceover. And so, uh, and so that was a lot of fun having folks come in and do the voices. Yeah. And uh, uh, reanimated movie classics are, they're very, they're kind of intensive because I'm doing all the work on it. I do it on my Mac. I, I'm, I'm, you know, the whole thing is on my Mac. Basically I'm, I'm making these in iMovie and, <laughs> which seems crazy and um, uh, doing the, you know, the, the, the sound effects and, and, and everything, um, even creating some, some music for them. Um, but they've been, they've been a lot of fun to do. They're kind of intensive, the work, but, uh, but they have been fun to do. Because board games kind of seem like a natural progression for you. When well, the minute you said that, my brain. Board like, games? Board games, yeah, RPGs. Oh. Yeah, it just sort of seemed like a natural oh fit with your storytelling, illustrations, horror, it kind of, it's, it, it kind of, I can totally see that. 
Yeah, I, I guess so. I, I Again, I don't now, but RPG is different from board game, right? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, it's a, a different bit. kind of thing. And I, yeah. um, I, I, and like I say, I, I en enjoy it without, um, enjoy working on them without fully understanding how they work. Um, which is probably nice. Works, yeah. Which, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful I don't have to know too much and I'm able to do a certain amount, you know, but, uh, but it's, been, it's been fun to do. So what would you like to do uh, winding this down, what would you like to do that you haven't gotten to do yet? Take a break. Yeah. Because well, you got one well, now. I have, been, <laughs> <laughs> I have been. We've 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 been doing these kickstarters for a year and a half, almost two years now, I think. Yeah. And um, it's been one Kickstarter to the next, putting out these Blu-rays, plus yeah. the illustration that I'm doing and other things, um, and. It has been one deadline. It's almost like having one big deadline for two years. And I just, I am like, I'm at the, I'm at the end of my rope here. I'm just like, I've got to take a break, man. This is crazy. So, mm -hmm. of course, what will happen is as soon as I get my, you know, things out of the way and take a break, something will come to me. Because as soon as you relax, ah, now I got nothing to do. I'll just sit back here and really wait a minute you know what i'd like to do and then i'll think of some stupid idea i want to do so that's that's how that's going to work i know that's how it's going to work but i'm, I'm but i am going to take some time off yeah i mean it's um it's it's interesting when you have things like that with relatives and people you work with they're like oh no he's at it again too you know here's another yeah. idea so right yeah it's annoying <laughs> I'm going to send this to you there. There you go. Um, but thank you for doing this. This is awesome. You know, well, Russ, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a good, and it's a, it's a great cause by the way. Yeah. I think that uh, the motion picture and television fund is an appropriate charity for SpyCon and, Ma and Monster Omicron. It sort of fits perfectly with yeah. everything they're doing. And, and I knew a, uh, I knew a, a character actor who was familiar from TV and stuff. Yeah. who was, you know, having a bit of a struggle. And it helped him incredibly. Yeah. Um, you kind of go, wow, thank God that was there. That's there. Because yeah. what would we do without it, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Good cause. Everything's, yeah, everything's nuts now. So, well, thank you so much for doing this. We really Thanks, appreciate Rob. it. And uh, do, is there... A place people can find you in one central location, a website, well, social I, media. Yeah, I do what want to send you to, uh, if I could send you to Hydraulic Entertainment, because um, you can get the Blu-rays there, plus mm -hmm. trading cards and other cool things. But also the, um, the uh, Big Dan Freighters CDs that are coming out. The first one, by the way, Volume 1 is being remastered, so both will be available. And, um, and we're excited about that. So I, if you just Google uh, Hydraulic entertainment or hydraulic lost skeleton anything like mm -hmm. that hydraulic forehead it'll come up yeah. and that money well, goes exactly to you too and it no uh, well, it, it goes to our group yeah but yeah um one other thing too um i, I have a bunch of books out i should i guess i should mention By all means. thing over the yes. past couple of years um i my, my most recent is i took all my sketchy cartoons and uh, single panel cartoons and put them together into a book. There's 200 of them in there. And it's called um, uh, uh, Johnny Russet, He Don't Like No Fried Food. <laughs> That's a title you don't hear every day. And no. um, if you go to, if you uh, Google um, uh, Lulu self-publishing, if you put Lulu Blamire, just like Lulu Blamire, like that's my name, but I don't go by Lulu. If you do that, <laughs> you'll, you'll go to my books, my various books, including the Westerns, plays, and so on, other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and so that helps too, because then you get the, the money directly. It doesn't go to, yes. Yes. you know. It's, it's better than, than, I have some on Amazon, but it's better going to Lulu because I get more. I and, get and more pe money. <laughs> and people want people, people to support the artist, and, you know, you don't want to live in Bronson Canyon, you know, so you'd like to, you'd like to be able to, you right. know, keep the house and right. you know. Although Bronson's kind of nice. Yeah. But yeah. 
Yeah. Let's yeah. throw a rug, a little throw rug, some pillows. You know, Bronson Caves are pretty cozy. Yeah, I can, I can well imagine. But yeah. thank you again for your time. It is, Thanks, it is so great to talk to you. Thank you.